Dr. Meredith Hancock, the president of Thomas Edison State University. We're the university that respects your learning wherever it occurs. This is Edison Soundstage, a podcast where we discuss the dynamic role of education in today's world. We have meaningful conversations with business and community leaders and with our students who are actively engaged in their professions and communities, all while earning a degree that builds their careers, advances their professions, and empowers their lives. Recorded and produced on our campus in Trenton, New Jersey, this is Edison Soundstage. Welcome to episode 14 of the Edison Soundstage podcast. In today's episode, I'm pleased to share with you a discussion with education leaders who can provide a personal perspective and collegial advice about the transition into education leadership positions. I'm Tara Kent, and I'm an associate dean in the Haven School of Art Sciences and Technology at Thomas Edison State University. I oversee the graduate and undergraduate programs in the arts, sciences, and education, including the master's in educational leadership program. We're really excited about this program because it's been completely updated and revised to reflect the most current research in the field, the new national professional standards, and new accreditation requirements. So we're very enthusiastic about the content to this program, but one of our greatest drivers is student success. And so we have been intentional in building resources to support our students and to assist them. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anthony Scotto. I am currently the Director of Curriculum and Instruction for the Hamilton Township School District in Mercer County. I also have the honor and pleasure of serving as an online instructor mentor for Thomas Edison State University, as well as doing some consulting work to help them in the area of professional development and their educational leadership network. Um, Before we begin our panel discussion this evening, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists and tell you a little bit about them. Our first panelist is Catherine Atwood. Catherine is the school business administrator, board secretary, for the Hamilton Township School District in Mercer County. She has over 24 years in New Jersey school finance and business operations. She served 11 years as the Director of Fiscal Policy and Planning and the Assistant Commissioner of Finance for the New Jersey Department of Education. Catherine holds an undergraduate degree from Brown University in Mathematical Economics and a master's degree in Government Administration from the University of Pennsylvania. Our next panelist is Dustin Baer. Dustin Baer graduated from Thomas Edison State University, a proud graduate, in March of 2015. He's the current principal of Cedar Grove High School, where he has served since November of 2020. Prior to that, Dustin served as the Director of School Counseling at Montclair High School from 2016 to 2020, and School Counselor at Mount Olive High School from 2010 to 2016. Dustin is excited for the opportunity to share his experience in educational administration and how Thomas Edison State University helped open professional pathways for him. Our next panelist is Patricia Haney. Patricia Haney is completing her 14th year as the superintendent of Logan Township School District in Gloucester County. Prior to this position, Patricia was the director of curriculum for several school districts. Patricia has served on many professional committees, including NJPSA and NJASA. Patricia holds an undergraduate degree from Temple University in elementary and early childhood education, and a master's degree in educational administration from Arcadia University. Our next panelist is Danielle Tan. Danielle Tan has been employed at the Hamilton Township Schools for 20 years. She is currently the supervisor of ESSA Grants, K-12 Library, and 9-12 Tech Business. Prior to this role, she served as supervisor of visual and performing arts for seven years. Before her role as supervisor, she served as an art teacher in the district for 12 years. Danielle holds two master's degrees and is currently pursuing a doctorate in higher education with a concentration in organizational leadership. And last but not least, Jennifer Becchiarelli. 
Jennifer is the current Assistant Superintendent of Special Services in the Bayonne School District. With a master's in educational leadership from Thomas Edison State University, Jennifer is currently pursuing a doctoral degree in leadership as well. Jennifer's professional expertise includes being a special education teacher at the secondary level, an assistant principal, and a building principal for six years before becoming the assistant superintendent of, of special services for Bayonne School District. Jennifer is also currently a mentor for NJPSA for new administrators and has previously taught in the education program at Georgian Court University as an adjunct professor. We've selected these fine individuals, not only for the degrees that they hold and the trainings that they've had, but what they do currently in the field as current practitioners. I will serve as facilitator. Our, our panelists were given the questions ahead of time. So in true teacher style, they are prepared and they are ready. And they'll have an opportunity to share things from their perspective. And that's why we wanted to tell you a little bit about their current roles. And we hope that this is a meaningful opportunity for any of you that are aspiring to become administrators or thinking about joining the Thomas Edison State University family. So panelists, I'm gonna get started with question one. I asked all of the panelists to think back to when they first became leaders. What experience or experiences best assisted them to transition into that role and why? So Dustin, I'm gonna start with you. If you wanna open your mic and share. Sure. Yeah. So my first my first administrative experience, I was a direct. I became a director of school counseling at Montclair Montclair School District. Uh, Montclair is a fairly large district, twenty two hundred students um, at the high school. So my my work was predominantly at the high school. It was kind of a, a trial by fire. You know, it was a highly political, um, high stress job. You know, it was kind of jump right in. So for me. You know, it was really about immersing myself into the school and just showing up every day and, and and trying to have a positive attitude. And, you know, I think you have to put yourself in a lot of unique situations and there's things you're going to do really well and there's going to be times you fail, but it's your attitude when it's your attitude throughout that process that helps you. Right. So you can't look at your failures as a testament to who you are. You have to look at your failures as learning experiences. Because if you learn from the failures and if you grow from them, then you won't make them again. And it will only serve to, to help you become a better administrator later down the road. So I think the biggest, my biggest piece of advice is, is to um, believe in yourself, you know, believe what it took to get to where you are in that position and not look at your failures as, as who you are as a person or as an administrator, but just continue to grow. Thank you, Dustin. Uh, Pat, I'd like you to now think about your journey. You you shared that you've served in the superintendency for quite some time. You had other roles prior to that. You know, Dustin talked about sort of the journey. Could you could you elaborate on your thoughts on that? Thanks, Anthony. Um, when asked that, when reflecting on my journey, I looked back to many many years ago. If I've been a superintendent for fourteen years, I've also so also important to know that I've been in public education for forty eight years. So I had to think back quite far. Uh, what experiences? Uh, best assisted me to transition from being a teacher to being a, a leader. And I thought about the fact that I was a classroom teacher for 16 years. I still identify myself as an educator, first and foremost. And I think that is critical as a superintendent. Um, and then in the last five years as a teacher, I became a teacher leader. And, to, and I think those five years as a teacher leader where I sat on a school leadership team meetings and began to see the complexity of a school system made me understand a little bit better of where of helping me to prepare. I will tell you that my master's program at what used to be called Beaver College in Glenside, Pennsylvania is now Arcadia University, had a nice mix of theory and practice where I began to understand the importance of how core values um, which should steer my decision-making when moving into leadership. 
And then I was lucky enough to serve as one of the first principal interns that Philadelphia school system had in two different placements in the Philadelphia school system. When staff looked to me the first time to solve problems as their school leader. So all of these leadership positions really, um, it, as and when I was still a teacher and an intern, really prepared me um, for the transition into being a leader. And finally, um, I was fortunate enough to spend two years as a principal in Philadelphia before I moved into central office uh, leadership. And those two years as a principal is what I continue to tap on when making daily decisions. I work so closely in my district with all my district administration, but especially with the principals who, so, and I relate to the complexity of that position and I connect it to my years as principal. It really is very helpful. Thank you, Pat. You know, Pat, you talk about core values. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists to take a look at number two, because equity is a, is a core value for many of us in this profession and has really been um, a, a, an important focus. Um, so I'm going to start with a school business administrator, because um, I have the honor and the privilege of working with Katie, who I know believes in this. But I, I think it's important that people hear it from the perspective of the school business administrator. So for our, our attendees, the question that I ask them to think about is, equity plays such an important role in schools and districts today. Can you share an example, Katie, of when equity was at the forefront of your administrative initiative? Yes, thank you for asking this question because I wanted to share my experience on this, which you're well aware because it's in our district, although it was really before you started, but one of the, um, and it continues, it's our goal as throughout um, for our senior staff, but when I first started working in this district, um, and, and again, uh, uh, flipping back to that last question, I feel like sometimes the goalie on the team in the district, like I'm the one who's like kind of doesn't fit in the peg of all the educators. Um, and it's really important that you need to be part of a team and want to understand everybody's role. So part of what I came into the district is I went and met with every principal. I went to the schools. I talked to them and I talked to them not just about their numbers and budgets, but what's working, what's not with the whole financial process. And it was evident for me from right from the start that there was not equity in the way monies were being allocated to the schools. I went to one school that said they did not have any assemblies, only uh, free ones because they didn't have enough money in their budget because they're PTAs and they didn't have a community that could also supplement. And when I found that out, I went back to try to look right away as to how schools had been funded through the central office to create their budgets. And it startled me to see that there was no system except that they were just held flat. And that was thought that was right. We didn't change it. Everybody got the same amount. It was equal. Equal is not equitable. So there had been no adjustment, one for enrollment changes, which you know is critical. I have 17 elementary schools. That changes three middle, three high. Nothing was adjusted for if there were more self-contained special ed or even at-risk students. So recognition of which you can measure by free and reduced population and the community. So while we created, I uh, created an initial system of allocating a per pupil amount, more for high school, more for middle, because that's rec that is, you know, recognizing of where the costs are higher, but also for those that have more at-risk students, more high, free and reduced, I increase the amount, recognizing the community and PTA support wouldn't necessarily be there as well as worked with special ed and any other at, any other unique characteristics of that school to increase what was given initially. But we never stop there. It's adjusted every year. But as a team, we meet with each school. We go over their budget and we ask those questions. And Anthony is one of the biggest person to ask most questions of, of how many assemblies do you have? And we ask them if they were being funded by another source, let's say PTA or field trips, they still should put that in detail with a zero cost. So we could assure there was equity, at least a minimum amount of same uh, experiences and opportunities for the students. So being a business administrator, somebody may say, I, I created my formula, it's equal, or I adjusted it, but it does not end there. You have to know 
and trust other people that know and work with others that know what is more what is needed in that school and you have the ability which is what's so great about working and you have such influence you can have in this position is to create ways to find opportunities to get the money where it's needed and so that was one of my i think very uh, successful changes here. And I know principals to this day will say that um, that is such a difference. I'm, I, it still mind boggles me, but it doesn't end there. And as I said, equity is our a senior staff goal. It's been a district goal since I've been here. And every year we look at different ways to ensure uh, we maintain that um, system and promote that. And it's not equal. Something that sounds so basic, but really um, people don't, even your board members, your future board members are not going to understand that. And many times they're going to want the same thing at every school. And you have to explain that some schools need more. Some schools can do with less and that's okay. Thank you, Katie. Uh, you know, Katie, you talk about uh, fair is not always equal, right? Uh, Jennifer, I would think in the area of student services that that is something that you often discuss and think about. Would you like to share with the group your thoughts on question two, where equity was at the forefront of your initiative or decision making? Yes. Yeah, so well, I was going to say in the special ed world, you know, that saying fair is an, doesn't always mean equal is so profound. Um, and, you know, when I looked at this question, I kind of looked through a, a different lens because our one of our goals that's been in, in our district, it's equity and diversity. When, and those two um, go together, you know, for us, very much hand in hand. So just from a little bit of a different perspective, um, you know, we look at our the diversity in our student body, in our community, and which should be represented um, within all levels of on all facets of the school from the senior level administration to the buildings and one of the things you know that i was very lucky to um encounter when i got here i'm the first assistant superintendent of special services there are two other assistant superintendents in the district one for curriculum and instruction and one for personnel um and i'm the first for uh, as an assistant superintendent of special services and I was able to start with creating a team. And I think this is an important lesson for, for new administrators, up and coming administrators. Um, when you look at diversity and equity, um, when I was starting to assemble my team, the last thing I wanted was to have five assistant supervisors that were exactly like me or had the same per, you know, exact perspectives as me. Um, it's so important for us as leaders um, to broaden our horizons. We want a team that we can, of course, trust, but we want to build that team with different perspectives and different points of views, because that's where we always get the best results and where, where we're promoting equity and diversity, um, you know, within that realm. So for me, not looking through one lens, you know, we need to be able to have the ability um, to accept and work and collaborate with differing views and opinions. And that's how we get the best results as leaders. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Danielle, you work with a lot of leaders, particularly in the portion of your position where you are the programmatic and some of the fiscal end of the ESSA grant. So while the principals have their allocations, where does equity come in for you as a supervisor when working with federal funds and building leadership? So the, the whole purpose of the ESSA grants is to provide a quality and equitable education for all students. Um, interestingly enough, when I read this question, I thought of the Perkins grant because of our audit this year for equity. <laughs> so that was the first thing that came to my mind. Um, and overseeing that department and being a first year leader in that department, I had to think very quickly and do some research before that big day. Um, in my opinion, I think we had done a great job in our department putting things in place, but as an administrator, it's important to know that, that shoo, that's over feeling is, is not a part of being an administrator. It's never over. It doesn't exist as an administrator there's always room for improvement. 
So while we investigated, we had to start developing plans um, for how to make it even better moving forward. Mr. Scotto and I immediately developed an equity committee for the CTE program. Um, and the teachers and I began working to identify any gaps and disparities among student subgroups to develop strategies um, to meet the needs equitably and responsibly for each of those subgroups. And then we have to determine moving forward how we would utilize Perkins or even title funds later to meet the needs of all students. I would think in that situation, Danielle, there needs to be a lot of collaboration. And for aspiring leaders, that, that key ingredient of not doing things in a silo, but working with other stakeholders, whether they be in central office um, uh, or in a building is important, which I think is a, a really nice segue for question three for our panel, right? So I, I think what all of you have been talking about is what effective leaders do, right? So um, for our attendees, I asked the panelists to, to sort of fill in the blanks on this sentence. Effective leaders should be blank because. So um, Jennifer, I'm gonna ask you to fill in the blanks and and, sh and, and tell us what you wrote. Okay, so I, I had more than one and, and I'll tell you why. So there's, there's a lot of qualities that an effective leader needs to be, but the first things that came to mind for me were compassionate, um, and transparent and accessible, which kind of go together. And, and the reason why I said compassionate is because a, a true leader really needs to have a handle on, you know, and with the, with the communication and the collaboration, you know, how the team is feeling, the whole vibe of what is going on with your team, with the community, with the students. It's really important, um, you know, to, to be able to, to have that empathy. It's, it's, it's just um, for all situations. And Accessibility and transparency go hand in hand for me because when you're a transparent leader, um, you know, you're going to be working, you know, and, and ensuring that you're working with integrity and honesty. And the more transparent you are, the more that your team will see that as far and as well as accessibility, being there for your people. It is so important to be present, not only there, but present with your, with your, for, for all students, staff, um, community, parents, you, you must be there and present um, because at the end of the day, we all know that the foundation is of, of the best leadership and how we are the most successful is building that trust. And to me, trust is the, the foundation that we keep building from. And we do that through accessibility, transparency, communication, collaboration. Thank you, Jennifer. Dustin, I would think as a high school principal, you're 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 managing all that and then some. How would you um, finish that sentence or add on to anything that Jennifer just shared? Yeah, I, you know, I um I think my answer is a little bit different because I, I am in the building. Um, but I don't. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with everything that that Jennifer alluded to. I struggled to find one or two words myself, and I came up with um, that an effective leader at, at the remember at the building level. An effective leader should be student focused, and the reason I wrote student focused was because, as a, as a, as an up and coming administrator, the best piece of advice I can ever give anyone is if you're if you're all if you ask yourself before any decision, is this what's best for kids? You'll never make the wrong decision, and people might disagree with you. There's three or four different ways to get to the same result. But if you've done what you believe is what's best for, for students and you're student focused, then you've made the right decision. Danielle, you've um, recently moved into a different administrative role. So you had uh, a good number of years in art music as a supervisor, and now you're working with grants and, and business and librarians. Um, but effective leadership should not change. So how would you finish that sentence for us, Danielle? I too couldn't think of one. It was really two, flexible and open-minded. It's really, really important because it allows you to adapt to the constantly changing circumstances to better suit the needs of your team and the district as a whole. And Pat and Katie, you are both working at the highest levels of leadership in the district and also dealing with boards of education. So um, as a superintendent, Pat, how would you answer that or finish that sentence for us? I kind of cheated a little bit and um, thought about the PSELs, 
uh, because that has really changed my life since they were, since I really have embraced them professionally. So I finished the sentence by embracing those standards and said, effective leaders should be using the PSEL standards as their guide, because those standards raise up our profession from simply managers to mm. leaders. And it makes the connection. They help us make the connection between school leadership and student learning. And, you know, Katie, sometimes they may just say you're just managing the money or you're just managing the bills, but you're doing so much more than that. Um, how would you finish that sentence? Well, I had two. Um, and I actually, the second one was the same one Danielle used, flexible. But my first one was committed. And I mean committed, meaning um, uh, um, devoted, not the other committed. Um, but devoted and passionate is probably the same word to what you're trying to do. Believe in it. Because when you believe in what you're doing and you can show that, people want to believe in it with you. Mm. And it's the same thing. If it, I would agree with what Dustin said. It's for the kids. It's for the right reasons. And you're committed to that. That's what will lead and be very effective. But you also, with that, have to be flexible because things change constantly. And you can't have that one goal and that one, one belief because um, it could change based on circumstances and it could change based on a really good idea that somebody else comes up with. So you have to be open and flexible to hearing and being part of the team. And especially in this position, because again, I'm not, I didn't have the same educator background that everybody else does. So I have to learn. I learn every day about what's important, what's not, but I have to trust you to tell me. And so you have to be flexible. You can't um, just say this way or no way. And I know many BAs and everybody says, oh, you just say no. Um, I truly believe that you can't just say no. You got to try to find the gray and you got to try to find the yes as much as possible. But um, be committed and I believe um, and devoted and gung ho on for the right reasons. A few moments ago, Pat held up a document and it, it stood for Professional Standards for Educational Leaders. So for our attendees, I asked the panelists to do a little homework. I gave them homework and I asked them to take a look at the 10 standards for professional standards for educational leaders. And for um, students um, and aspiring students, I can wholeheartedly tell you that many things at Thomas Edison are aligned to these amazing standards. I can let all of you know as aspiring administrators that sometimes our evaluations are connected to these standards or our goal setting, or as we're being mentored as new leaders, our work wraps around this. So um, I'm gonna ask the panelists to get ready for number four. I'm just gonna mention the themes, the, the titles of each standard. So these standards focus on 10 main areas. They are as follows, mission, vision, and core values, ethics and professional norms, equity and cultural responsiveness, curriculum, instruction and assessment, community of care of support and support for families, professional capacity of school personnel, professional community for teachers and for staff, meaningful engagement of family and community, operations and management, and school improvement. There is no hierarchy in these standards. I just want to point that out. Which standard in your current context and where you are right now resonates most with you and why? Danielle, can I start with you? Uh, you would think that curriculum would be as a curriculum supervisor, <laughs> but that's not the case. Ethics and professional norm resonate with me the most because I strongly believe that adhering to ethical standards and professional guidelines really is essential for creating a successful school system. It doesn't just protect the welfare of all of the members of the school community, but it also sets an example um, for the community and fosters an environment of success. In my opinion, a leader's duty is to make difficult decisions with integrity and not take shortcuts, pass the blame or make excuses. You have to be ethical and professional. Now, I'll often say I'd rather be criticized for following the rules than breaking the rules, right? And I think uh, Danielle really captured that. Um, Jennifer, as someone serving at the helm of overseeing student services, which standard resonates most with you and why? Well, like Pat said earlier, you know, all the standards resonate with me and, you know, from our professional ethics um, 
like Danielle was just talking about, to community relations. I mean, they they all play a part in, in our day. Um, I, I, I do feel that the mission, vision, and core values are is, is, a, is the first standard. And I think it's really important because at the start of becoming an educational leader and, you know, really like having that shared vision and mission and getting the buy-in from your community, the buy-in from your staff and, you know, working collaboratively towards that goal is, is so vitally important. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's how we stride every day. And the core values, I think is also vitally important because, you know, for me, my core values aren't something I just practice in my personal life or when I'm with my friends. My core values are apparent and on the forefront in every facet of my life, personal and professional. And in the decision making, it's vitally important that your core values, who you are as a leader, who you are as a person, it's going to come into play. And that's where the decision making comes because, like, um, Dustin had a great answer. and. I loved your answer before, because as a building principal for six years, I, I definitely would have said the same thing. Um, it's crazy how things change a little bit when you when you move positions. But at the end of the day, everything that we do, all of my core values, my my mission, my vision is all for the benefit of students and for the for the what is best for them. And as a leader, the only way you could really like the way I go to bed every night is that every decision I make is for the what's best for kids and it doesn't matter what people put on Facebook or people you know don't they don't know all the facts Wh what we do it has to be for the best of kids and that's why the mission the vision and your core values have to be a part of that every single day. Jennifer can I ask you a follow-up to that? Of course. You mentioned in the beginning that you are the first person in this role in mm -hmm. your district. Yes. What advice would you give to an aspiring administrator if they move into a new position that is newly created and maybe the mission vision is only written on a piece of paper and hung in the hallway? <laughs> how do you how do you make that real? Well, for as a brand new administrator, my first, you know, my first several months, almost a year in, um, you know, you really need to take a step back and observe and assess and reflect and see, you know, what is going on. Developing relationships was for me, job one, because in order to, you know, really get a joint mission and, you know, the vision and, and have people have the buy-in, I need to develop a relationship with them. I have a wonderful director that's been here for a long time and several assistant supervisors. There was already a lot of great things going on here. And I, and I was so lucky to come in, you know, with such, you know, a great start. Um, but, you know, then by developing those relationships, you know, we together collaboratively, like once that team is really starting to be built, you develop that joint mission and vision. And that's what you all start working towards. It's the only way to get the buy-in. So coming in, you know, you can't just you know, put what you want out there and just expect everyone that that's what we're working towards. You have to take a step back. You have to assess, be transparent, be accessible. Like there's 11 elementary schools in this district and a high school with 3000 students. I'm walking those schools every day. I'm meeting with the principals, meeting with the assistant principals, going into classrooms, saying hi to teachers. You know, you have to make the role what you want it to be. And, you know, in order to really get that that buy-in, you have to build those relationships and really assess before creating. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Dustin, as a high school principal, which of those 10 standards resonates with you most and why? Yeah, you know, and just like everyone, I'm sure we, I, I can certainly pull from each, each of these standards. I would say right now at this moment in my career and, and uh, my position as principal, I would say school improvement resonates the most. Um, I started here November 2020, right dead center of the pandemic. My first week, uh, I didn't even leave the, the the kitchen room table because we were on a we were on a shutdown, so it was a little crazy. But what that offered me was an opportunity to really do a deep dive into enrollment trends and scheduling and 
where are our students, how are our students doing in their four years, or really starting in eighth grade and, and following them over, you know, you know, multiple years worth of data. And, and what I found was some major gaps, some major gaps in opportunity, some major, um, some protocols that were significantly holding our, our students back. So I've been working for the past two years to remove those barriers for our students and to create a more inclusive scheduling process. And through that, we've seen tremendous uh, improvement. We've seen uh, AP and honors enrollment on the on the upswing. We've seen registration for AP exams going up. We're seeing um, we're, we're, it's just it's, it's been tenfold. So I'm in the mode right now of school improvement. That's great. Thank you. And thank you being for being committed to that um, every day for high school students. That's great. Katie, your thoughts on the standard? Um, I hope it's just not a Hamilton thing, but it's for me, it's ethics and professional uh, norms as well. Same as Danielle. Um, you know, for me, uh, and, and a lot has to do with the, you know, being in the financial field. Um, it's extremely important um, to have integrity, to ensure, um, be transparent, to ensure we follow the rules. But um, every decision uh, needs to be an ethical one. And it's important for me to work for somebody that I believe is equitable, uh, ethical. Um, and uh, those and, 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 and also treat people with respect, professional standards, um, and be transparent. I definitely that's all that's the one that popped out of me before I even had to go past number two. And they touch so many of those standards, don't they, Katie? Mm -hmm. They really do. This, this uh, which standard is most meaningful to me, it's definitely morphed over my years. I am also, my background is curriculum instruction. So when I began the superintendency role, curriculum instruction was, and school improvement, Dustin, was my, you know, my focus. Um, but over the years, over the past 10 years, especially equity and culturally responsiveness has really guided my, my daily decision making. And I think it's the uh, what's occurring in the, our national news with uh, the murders that have gone on has really uh, focused our internal uh, work here in our district that equity and culturally responsiveness is. But that is post COVID. It's even morphed even further to really focus on the two standards uh, that are based on um, students, which is community of caring and support. Uh, boy, do our students really need to, we, they need our support and guidance in how to, we need to have our staff building relationships with our students because of what they've suffered during the COVID uh, uh, years. Um, and so community of caring and support for students has really been our focus. And then finally, meaningful engagement of families and community. I mean, they, I've totally shifted my our focus internally uh, because of because of our equity movement into that because of the marginalized parents that we uh, recognize and realize that we have to bring into um, into decision making in our district. So it is a constant morphing. That's why I love the standard so much because it allows you to develop as a leader and and grow as a leader and and at each year. Uh, or each, you know, five years, you can um, morph into a stronger leader. Thank you, Pat. Um, I know you have the, um, the printed copy in front of you. So I'm going to ask you to go to standard three for a minute, Pat. So folks, um, Pat talked about how equity and culture responsiveness has been uh, a big part of what she does all the time. And, and within these standards, there are specific components. And Pat, I'm going to have you just look at component F for a minute. I'll read it uh, to our attendees. And then could you speak to that as a, as a superintendent? But what advice would you give to aspiring administrators that are trying to, quote, promote the preparation of students to live productively in and contribute to the diverse cultural context of a global society? And I know that's a loaded question, but... What advice would you give to an aspiring leader who wants to be effective in that area? This is a really hard, uh, a hard task um, to change your lens that you're looking at things, um, to become more culturally aware and culturally responsive to the wide range of students who enter students and staff who enter our schools every day. Um, you know, I'm looking in front of this group and I see uh, all white faces. And yet our, st our students 
uh, po the student population, not just in my district, but across the state of New Jersey are not similar. So first of all, promoting and really reaching out and trying to build um, a, a diverse staff. And uh, that is something that is continues to be work every single day um, of what I'm trying to do because students need to see in their classrooms and in their in their classrooms people who look like them. So I think co developing cultural awareness, realizing that everything should not be through the white majority lens. And that is that is not easy, um, but it is critical, critical because our public schools in New Jersey needs to need to recognize that our students don't look like what, what I'm looking at right now. And they and students need to see someone who looks like them in order to uh, feel uh, comfortable and safe and, and uh, understand why schooling and education is important. So I would say that's how you do it. You It's an ongoing job. It never ends, right, Pat? Never ends. Work in progress. That's why I'm still doing this job. It's because ever since I've embraced the equity uh, standard, I realized it's like a never ending process. You could be doing this for the next 20 years and still not accomplish it. What Pat just said was so profound and so right on target. Um, with the diversity piece. And I was, I got into this a little bit before because for me, diversity and equity go together. And I, I really firmly believe that, um, you know, ensuring that, you know, you also get the, you, when I say the vibe of the community, what diversity is in your community should be represented from the senior level administration, you know, throughout all facets of the educational milieu and, and, that is so important because our kids deserve and need to feel um, that they are represented and that is how they feel they belong. So I just, I want to, Pat, that answer was just wonderful. And um, I wish we we could, you know, write it down somewhere and, and remember, but we're getting a recording. So we'll be able to remember that. Was, <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Um, and we've heard these, these terms several times in the last uh, so many minutes and it's, Communication and collaboration are key components to educational leadership. What I asked the panelists to share and be ready to talk about is, how have you grown in this area as an effective school leader? Dustin, can I start with you? You know, obviously, again, going back to when I first started out as an administrator, director of school counseling in Montclair, um, that was a big piece of my role in the communication, um, making sure that all of our families are are, are receiving information and that there's a clear lines of communication. Uh, but as a principal, it's, I think it's more about consistency, um, having a consistent means of communication, making yourself available to, uh, to parents, to staff members, to students. Um, and, and really just, like I said, just being that consistent, that consistent person. Um, how have I grown? I think, you know, I, I, I thought about this for a while. I think I would say how I've grown as, as a new administrator, it's very hard not to take things personal. You bring a lot home with you. You don't understand how somebody could talk to you that way. How could someone be so irrational? And I think the more and more experience you get in dealing with people and understanding um, how people interact with each other, you start to understand that, look, People do odd things. People say odd things. Again, going back to what I said earlier, you have to stick to your core values. You have to stick to doing what's best for kids. And as kids, as long as you're doing that, I think it was said earlier, you can put your head down on your pillow at night and sleep well. So you have to find that balance of being a consistent communicator, but also not taking things too personal. And that's not easy. It's not. There's no secret sauce for that, right, Dustin? Right, right. Um, Katie, as school business administrator, you have to communicate and collaborate with every single stakeholder in the district. Would you like to share your thoughts on that question? Yes, and and as most school business administrators, we probably would like to be numbers and behind uh, the screen and and doing analysis. So, for a lot of us, and me included, um, reaching out and talking is not our number one strength but it's probably the number one important thing to do, especially when you work in a school district. I mean, I said that initially, um, being part of a team, this is a team. This isn't an individual. We don't do our jobs and 
um, individually. We have to come together and, and, and work as a team. And yes, I can get a phone call from a parent, a very angry parent about a bus, their student not being picked up from the bus stop. I can get at the same time, um, just today, having to deal with uh, um, bees uh, that immediately have to be removed, but they're protected and you can't just tear them down like we always did. And we had to finally find a bee um, keeper. When do, you, when do you think in your job at working a school, you've got to look for beekeepers? Um, and figure out a way to get them when you know they're not a company and you know they don't have a BRC and they don't have all the rules and you just have to make it happen and we make it happen. Um, to, to, I would absolutely agree with not taking it personally. Um, it's very hard, you know, I go to every board meeting in this job and you hear a lot of things that people say and a lot of implications that you're doing things for the wrong reasons. And, and especially for somebody like me, we're doing things for the right reason and being ethical and those standards are so important. It is hard to want to get, get up and do it again. Um, but you get up and do it again because you all did it for the first time to make improvements and have influence and help students and be part of this. Uh, my background started in private sector. I chose to go into public sector because I wanted to do this. This is what I felt was right to do. And I've moved to multiple different um, industries and ended up with education for now the last 20 years and uh, 24. And um, it's because being part of a team, you have to not be individualized. You have to collect, you have to work together and you have to recognize that you're not gonna like everybody you're working with too. Um, that's another challenge that you will have um, and everybody, but everybody, you have to figure their value and, and work within that because more is better than less. Um, more information is always better than less. You make better decisions. I'm a question, I'm, I ask more questions, I drive people crazy because I don't believe there's one answer. There is two plus two, but not to the ways that you could get to um, a solution. Thank you, Katie. Danielle, you're communicating and collaborating with people maybe in a different way these days. Would you like to share how you've grown in that area? When I first started in this role, there was a completely, completely different senior staff team. So processes were very different. Um, we're a very massive district and virtual meetings before COVID weren't really the norm. So we didn't really meet with other administration often and because of that there were certain policies and procedures that were a bit disjointed from school to school which impacted the faculty who I was overseeing and even the instruction that took place from school to school. Under new leadership um, we meet all the time and I've learned that effective communication and collaboration helped to resolve areas of inequity and overall allows for better district-wide decision-making and implementation of educational strategies and organizational goals. Anthony, I wanna add just one thing to that from my perspective on communication. Um, it's even better just to say, I'll get back to you, especially in my role, when you have angry people calling you, I hear you and we're working on it, we'll get back to you. Just that um, goes a long way. It does. And it has a customer service approach to it that you want to take the time to get them the, the right information or the right answer to resolve. Pat, you've been a leader for quite some time. Lots of years. And you're a very effective leader. I know that firsthand. And you're always reflecting. So as you reflect on your growth in the area of communication and collaboration, where do you feel you've grown the most? In regards to communication, um, I think clarity, clarity when communicating both orally and in writing is really critical. And by that, I mean, um, you know, taking something as, as simple as communicating to parents when uh, we used to have snow days. Well, this year, we didn't have a snow day. But um, <laughs> when we, you know, on making that announcement, I always explain to parents, even in the morning when they just want to know if schools are closed or not, why I'm making the decision to close school. You know, there's ice on the road and we're worried about buses. 
uh, slipping, you know, giving parents that background knowledge of why we make the decisions we make. Um, the other thing about clarity and, and sharing decision making, an example would be, and this has to do, Catherine, with budgeting right now, right? And we're sharing the budget, is really making sure the community and the staff members, staff members, understand why the certain decisions, decisions are being made in regards to the budget. So I meet with all staff members before the board meeting so that they understand the thinking that went into the budget. And then giving the community that background knowledge, even though they don't vote on the budget anymore, giving them that rationale so they understand why we're thinking what we're thinking. And then the other area of communication is how I communicate with my board. And I've done this ever, for the 14 years that I've had a, a wide range of board members come and go. And that is, I do, I really spend a lot of time in my, and I used to call them Friday memos. I now call them weekend memos. And sometimes they get into the beginning of the next week memo. But I all, really spend a lot of time to provide my board members, and those nine different pe people who think and really have to understand the way I think. Um, that background knowledge of what we're doing in the district. We have, I have found that the more I spend time communicating with my board ahead of time, the bet, the smoother our board meetings go because they understand the rationale. So that understanding, explaining why you do what you do. Some people say, you know, it's dangerous. I don't believe it is. I believe that transparency is critical. And if you're, if you have ethics, right. And, and you know, your core values and you know that um, equity is what your core value is based on, then you're going to be, you're going to be okay. Thank you, Pat. Jennifer, you've served in a variety of administrative roles. You're working with parents a lot in student services. In what area have you grown the most? So this was such a great question because the two parts with regards to communication um, in, in, in a broader term, Good, a, a relationship that has good communication is going to be successful, whether it's personal or in your professional life. And I think a part of communication is listening, the most important part for me, because then we're learning. And, and so when, it, when we say communication, it's not just about us speaking, it's about really listening. And this comes into play with collaboration. So I thought this was such a good lesson um, that I think I've really learned um, or how I've grown. I realized that, you know, being part of a team and collaborating with my team, I never always want to be the smartest person in the room. You know, I want to be able to, uh, you know, absorb all of the different resources around me with my team. Like you want to build a team with knowledgeable individuals who are trustworthy, and that's where the best collaboration comes into place. If, if I'm always the smartest person, how am I ever learning? I always want to continue to learn and grow as a leader by working collaboratively um, with my team, because in, in all in all, nothing as a leader, if, if I could really give you one great piece of advice, you know, nothing is done in isolation. We as leaders are only as good as our team and their successes are our successes and our successes are theirs. And we, you know, working together and collaborating and understanding that how vitally important your team is and making sure they feel valued um, is just something I've really learned and, and grown with as I, you know, moved through the different facets of my educational uh, leadership journey. I have a question I'd like to ask some of you, and um, this is a little more open. So those that would like to answer it, fine. Um, if I'm in my internship right now, and I'm in the final stages of becoming an administrator, and I'm getting ready to apply and, and you move to that next context, that next step, what should I pay most attention to in my administrative internship? And we have a variety of roles on the screen here. So we may have a variety of answers. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things, but it just, you know, if I'll mention one because I, I, I'm sure the whole group has some. Um, but as you're working and, you know, you're learning, watching every move, it's so important to understand why things are happening the way they are happening. And it's, it's okay to ask questions. You have to ask questions. And also, depending on, you know, where you're, you know, passion lies or what your choices are like is that a district that's more in an urban area do you want to work in a low socioeconomic area you know what are your strengths what are your weaknesses and where will you where will your strengths best be utilized in what type of district i mean those are so important because you really 
it, you have to find your niche. Um, and, you know, the, there's such a varying differences between school districts, you know, do you want to work in a larger district, a smaller district, what do you like about where you are, what don't you like. Um, so it, it is, a, you know, there's a lot of questions I don't want to overwhelm but but you know those are just a few that are important to, to recognize for yourself. I would say I would say on top of that start to think about building your team right. When you become an administrator, your goal, ultimate goal is to become an administrator. Well, when you're in that role for the first year, two years, three years, four years, um, you're going to need people to rely on who've done the work prior. And you want to develop those relationships. You want to um, cultivate those relationships because you're going to need people to call and you're going to have questions and you're going to say, who is my team? So I would say start to build that team around you. And during your internship, um, observe the various members of the teams that are already in place and watch the different styles they have and the different skill set and the different expertise and how they individually work and then how they work jointly as a team and 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 pick up from that. So observation. That that's actually what I was going to say. Be a sponge, observe, but also don't be afraid to go the extra mile with I mean, staying a little bit later because the person's there and you can participate in something else or observe something else, um, you, you know, take put in that put in that time, um, because I think you uh, watch whenever you're first going to be in any job, sit back and, and, and don't make changes right away. You always want to observe. You want to talk to people. You want to see how things go before, even if you have your straight idea. So if I was in there going in and watching that, I'd I'd be just seeing what's going on and 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 I would agree figuring out is this what I want to do is this is this this is this the environment or is it different well none of I don't think any of you formally serve as board members in a school district um, I think this would be an important question to ask you folks and for those of you that'd like to share so we have a question in the chat that says what is the process of becoming a board member there is still a lack of diversity or perspective in these spaces that are designed to aid children in a K-12 setting. So while we know that we are not directly the ones that select the board, but we work closely with the board, um, what, what would be that process that you would recommend if someone wanted to become a school board member? I would first say go to some board meetings. Um, observe and watch and see if that's what you want to do. Uh, personally, I mean, the process is there's, if you go right on to uh, a web stage, you could see the process. You have to get signatures, enough people, you have to submit them into the county office and then you run, but you just don't win. You have to, um, you know, you have to go out and, and talk to people. To be an effective board member, um, you really want to know why you want to do it. That's why I would go. Why do you want to do it? And I would hope it'd be for the right reasons, because I think we all know there are some, um, you know, you want it to be because you want to help and uh, be, uh, you're an admin, you're, you are not the administrator. So you set policy and you set the budget, um, but you don't direct the day-to-day -day activities. And if that's what you want to do, because it's, you've got a lot of influence. Um, the process is pretty simple, but I would first go to board meetings and then start talking to your community as to what they want, what you want to represent. I would just reiterate what Catherine said about um, the really examine why you want to be a board member, um, that it can't be for your own individual good. It should not be. Um, I will say to you over the 14 years I've been a superintendent, there we've been very fortunate in our district that most of the board members have been more um, global in their in their. Uh, the reason for being on the on the board, but you also get individuals who want to make individual decisions. And as Catherine said, that's not your job as a board member. And understanding that you are, you know, your biggest job is policy making, uh, uh, approving the budget, right, Catherine, and then hiring the superintendent to to let the superintendent make those decisions. But that's it. And a lot of board members really believe that they're they're involved in the day to day operations, and they really should not be. I just want to take a minute and first uh, mention to Jennifer and to Dustin, you know, sometimes you meet people professionally and you say, boy, I would love to work with them. So mm -hmm. Jennifer and Dustin, it was so awesome to hear what you're doing uh, because I believe in what you're doing. So thank you. And also to have alum of the university was awesome. 
And then I, I would be remiss if I didn't just recognize three other people. Uh, Katie Atwood is the best school business administrator I have worked with in 18 years of being a central office leader. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And I just appreciate what she does every day. Um, Pat Haney is not only a colleague, but a dear friend. And I have learned so much about equity because of Pat. And Pat and I have studied the standards like the alphabet, right, Pat? We have done that. We know them. <laughs> and so I just appreciate you uh, being here tonight and all that you do. And Danielle Tan, who is one of the best supervisors that I have ever had on my team. And no matter what the task, she is amazing and works hard and is ethical and 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 focused. So I, I just wanted to thank all of you. I really I like the fact that this is a team here that shows the wide range of leaders that really are need to work together um, in, in it to make a school system work. Yeah. So uh, that that's what Anthony, I think, was trying to accomplish. And I think you accomplished it, Anthony. <laughs> Anthony, thank you so much for preparing. You know, I know we spoke on the phone. I, I really appreciate you taking time uh, to do that with me. I um, I just have to say all of you, um, it was an honor to serve on this panel with all of you and with Cindy and Dr. Kent, you know, thank you both. Um, Dustin, I have to tell you, being a building principal for six years was my favorite job. And Catherine, the BA in my district was also the BA when I was, um, we moved districts together. He was the BA where I was the principal, but he is literally one of my favorite people in the world. And I, and he has taught me so much about budgeting and equity and forecasting. And I, you know, he's just amazing. And, and uh, so I know, like you were saying, like, sometimes you feel like in isolation with your job because it's so different from everyone else. Um, even though you're like, you know, you and the superintendent are the two, uh, you know, head honchos, but you know, I just want to you to know like how much value I have for my BA and I could see that your team has it for you as well. So, but you can't be isolated in this job and Anthony and no, I are you very, very, very closely. And, uh, and even just today we had a Danielle, Anthony and I just had a call. <laughs> so, um, it's, uh, appreciate it. I appreciate all the nice comments and it's just, it, it makes you, when you participate in something like this and still hear all everybody's passion and excitement, it just, it helps you. Yeah, yeah, recharges us. Has, yeah, it was, it, it, this was such an honor, you know, to hear from all the different, you know, from Danielle and Pat, like, gosh, you know, you're like, God bless you, like 48 years in education. And I mean, just amazing stuff all around. Pat, it was a huge honor. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, certainly very impressed by all of you. And, and I, I really appreciate the honor. Thomas Edison has been very good to me and opened up a lot of pathways for me. And, you know, I would be happy to do this anytime. And I also want to thank um, uh, Dr. Kent and Cindy Strain. And for those of you that are considering graduate school, it's, it's hard work, but it pays off. And you can see it in the passion of all of our panelists this evening. If you're interested in finding out more about the Masters of Arts in Educational Leadership program, just search for graduate programs on the tesu.edu website. Thanks for listening to Edison Soundstage. This podcast was produced by Thomas Edison State University.